we were talking about hydrogen bonds. So let's keep talking about hydrogen bonds. I can't remember what bullet we got to here. Um, to E. Boy, I sure wish this had the same letters that you guys have. I don't. Oh, so we hadn't done this? Now I'm pretty sure we were doing hydrogen bonding. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just I'll kind of talk through this. If you've already got this written down, fine. Just pay attention, and then when it gets to a part where you need to fill in blanks, then you can start filling them in. Um, remember, we talked yesterday about yesterday about dipole-dipole interactions. Okay. Um, now, when I say dipole-dipole, what am I talking about? Thank you. Polar bond. Very good. Talking about polar. Back now. Back now. No. Talking about polar bonds. Okay. Now, polar bonds. What do I mean when I say polar bonds? That they're unsymmetrical. Uh, they are unsymmetrical, but that's not really what polar means. There's a positive and a negative end, right? Okay. So, if there's a positive and a negative end, and that means that the positive end might be attracted to the negative end on a different molecule, right? You guys remember we talked about the difference between inter and intramolecular, right? Interstate highway goes where? It goes between different states, right? Okay, so an intermolecular force is between two different molecules, all right? Intramolecular is, you know, the bonds inside the molecule itself, okay? So hydrogen bonding is an example of an intermolecular force, a force between two molecules. They're just kind of attracted to each other, all right? And it's a special type of dipole-dipole interaction. I think this actually is the last thing we talked about. So we talked about the fact that hydrogen bonding is fawn. Remember? It's fawn. Okay? Fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. If you have a hydrogen connected to one of those three atoms, then there can be hydrogen bonding. So here's what happens. Okay? You've got a hydrogen connected to a fluorine. Now, fluorine... You remember us talking about uh, the electronegativity chart? Where does fluorine rate on that electronegativity chart? It's the most electronegative, which means what? It goes in the middle. Well, no, it never goes in the middle, right? Say that again. Okay, not, you're close. It, it wants the most valence electrons, right? It's, it's trying to pull the, elec the electrons close to itself when it's in a bond with something else, okay? Fluorine always wins the tug of war, okay? It always pulls the electrons closer to itself when it's sharing. So fluorine is kind of, it's, this is an extreme case of dipole-dipole, and there's a couple of ways you could write this. Remember the arrow shows that the electrons are going towards the fluorine here in this bond, but you could also write your little negative and positive, your supalatal negative, supalatal positive on here to show that the fluorine side of this molecule is a lot more negative than the hydrogen side. Okay? No, that, that stuff you're not going to have to worry about. Okay? I, I just want you to be able to identify polar or nonpolar. I don't care if you write in the, the vectors or the um, soup ladles or whatever. Okay? Um, so the reason this is such an extreme case is because fluorine is so electronegative, it really pulls those electrons away from the hydrogen. Okay? Well, poor hydrogen only had two electrons to begin with. So if those electrons are pretty much pulled away from it, now hydrogen is basically just a positive charge, right? Because what does hydrogen normally have in it? Usually has, well, look at the periodic table, right? What does that one mean? It means it has one proton and one electron, right? And that's it. That's all hydrogen is, one proton, one electron. Well, if its electrons get pulled away from it, it's just a proton basically. So it's just this positive charge, right? So this hydrogen really positively charged, if something else comes along, like another HF, for example, and this hydrogen sees electrons over here, it gets really excited, right? Because it's just a positive charge at this point, so it's, it's attracted strongly to these electrons on the fluorine, okay? This right here, that's a hydrogen bond, okay? That's hydrogen's attraction for another molecule that also has hydrogen bonding, okay? And so what happens here is you basically get this hydrogen, which is very positively charged, and it's attracted to a lone pair of electrons on something else, 
Okay, that's hydrogen bonding. Does that kind of make sense? It's, it's just like dipole-dipole, except it's stronger. That's what you really need to remember, okay? How do you know it's stronger? Because it's so polar, right? The more polar it is, the stronger the, the attraction for those two molecules are going to be, because the more of a positive and a negative end that you have. Okay? Yes, sir? Uh, yes. Okay, so that's hydrogen bonding, okay? Remember, that only happens when hydrogen is connected to a fluorine, an oxygen, or a nitrogen. That's it. Uh, multiple attached regions can also occur within these bonds. So you could have, all that's saying is you could have several of these molecules that are attracted to each other, okay? This explains why water is a liquid at room temperature, okay? Um, so, H2O, we've already talked about this, right? Is that hydrogen bonding? Well, yes, it can do hydrogen bonding, but the way I drew it, there's no hydrogen bonds there, right? Okay? These are just covalent bonds. But if I draw another one up here, is that hydrogen bonding? Yeah. Because this is the attraction of one water molecule for another. Okay? It's not... These bonds right here are covalent bonds. Those aren't intermolecular or hydrogen bonds, okay? So students get confused on that sometimes. They say, oh, this is a hydrogen bond. Well, no, it's not. This is a covalent bond. The hydrogen bond is this attraction right here of this hydrogen for this oxygen. Back over here, please. Okay. The strength of the hydrogen bond is directly related to the electronegativity of the atoms involved, which we already talked about that. We talked about electronegativity already. This is important, though. This point right here, I don't know what letter this is on your notes. What letter is that? This explains why water is a liquid at room temperature. Oh, you don't have that on your notes? Awesome. Um, maybe you should write that in somewhere, okay? This is why water is a liquid at room temperature. The stronger these intermolecular forces, the more likely something is to be a liquid or a solid at room temperature, okay? If something has weak intermolecular forces, guess what it's going to be at room temperature? A gas, because the particles aren't that attracted to each other, so they just kind of fly off wherever they want to go, okay? If the particles are held closely together, then you've got a liquid. If they're held really tightly together, then you've got a solid, okay? Everybody with me on that? Okay. Yes. Can I? Oh, yeah. Sorry. That part at the bottom, I, I don't know why it's there. I wouldn't worry about that. I guess I used water as an example. But. Okay. I'm going to show you a better picture of hydrogen bonding than the one I drew up there. In that picture, where are the hydrogen bonds? The dotted lines, right? Here's an H bond right here. Here's an H bond right here. Those are, are those intra or intermolecular forces? Are they between molecules or are they inside the molecule? They're between, so it's inter, right? Like an interstate highway, okay? No, no, those aren't molecules. That's just, I don't know why they made them. I, they should have made them. Oh, you're talking about this? Yes, that's a molecule. That's, that's a, a hydrogen, hydrogen, and an oxygen, right? So H2O. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Between is inter. Okay, intra is the bonds within the molecule. So actually, really the way we normally draw this, we put an O here, an H here, and an H here, right? So that's, it's just a different way of showing the same thing. Okay, good. <laughs> that's a good thing. All right, so we okay there? These are covalent bonds right here within the molecule itself. Between the molecules, that's the hydrogen bond. That's the intermolecular force. OK? 
Okay. Um, these intermolecular forces can do some really interesting things. For example, and we've had a lot of this this summer, summer, <laughs> this winter, um, we've had a lot of snow, right? Um, the way that these crystals form, the way that they're attracted to each other as they're falling, it actually determines the shape of the snowflake, all right? And you guys, have, I'm sure you've heard this before, no two snowflakes are alike, right? We are all individuals, just like the snowflakes. <laughs> you ever heard that before? Um, anyway, but it is kind of cool to look at these in a really magnified view, because that's, that's the kind of structure, that's the kind of shape they can take, just based on the way that the water molecules are attracted to one another when they're frozen, okay? So you can get these really elaborate, complex shapes. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's why what what happens to it? It's a little more spread out of a structure. Um, so that's how you get those crystal-like structures. This I don't know. I mean, I guess we can kind of talk about this. I'm not sure this is going to make a lot of sense to you, but if you if you notice this, the trend here. If you look at group 4A, carbon, silicon, germanium, tin. If you look on the periodic table, that's uh, Starting with carbon, we're just going down that column, right? So carbon with hydrogen, silicon with hydrogen, germanium with hydrogen, and tin with hydrogen. You see that? Now, what's the trend that you notice there in boiling point? Yeah, the bigger the molecule gets, the higher the boiling point, which means the bigger the molecule gets, the more they like to stay together, so the harder it is to get them to escape as a gas. Does that kind of make sense? Heavier molecules probably wouldn't escape as a gas quite as easily as the lighter ones, okay? So that's, you would kind of expect that. But then if you look in the column uh, next to that, group 5A, you've got pH3, ASH3, SBH3, okay? And those all follow that same trend, but you look at the nitrogen, it's way up here. It should be, it should be down here, right? The same thing with the HF, right? HCl, HBr, HI, those follow a pretty even trend there. But the HF is way up here instead. And then the H2O is way up here in that column. So what is it that's causing these three, the H2O, the HF, the NH3, to be, uh, have higher boiling points than they really should for their particular column? The, what's stronger? Which, which bonds? Be specific. So close. Inter. The intermolecular forces are stronger. And those are the hydrogen bonding ones, right? Remember, this is fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. Those are the three that when hydrogen bonds with them, they will have higher boiling points because they have stronger intermolecular forces. Okay? Okay, this is doing some stuff. Okay, water is obviously unique. You guys have learned this, right? Remember what happens to water when it freezes? Most things, when they freeze, when they become a solid, they compress, right? They get smaller and more dense. What happens to water when it freezes? It expands, right? It actually gets less dense. So ice is less dense than water. Now, how would you know that even before I told you that? What happens when you put ice cubes in a glass of water? They float, don't they? Okay, that doesn't work for most things. You put a solid uh, and it's liquid in the same container. For most things, the solid will sink to the bottom because it's more dense. But with water, it floats. Why is that a good thing for fish? Well, it, okay, so let's think. We've had a really cold winter, right? So Lake St. Louis, okay? What happens to the fish in Lake St. Louis? If that top layer of ice freezes because the, water's, or because the air is cold, well, what happens to that ice if it's more dense than the water? It'll go all the way down. to sink. And then what happens to the next layer that freezes? Sinks, freezes, sinks. Now you've got layer on layer of ice, and the poor fishes get crushed, right? Um, what really happens, though, because the ice is less dense than water, that top layer freezes and it stays on the top because it floats on top of the water, right? So then the fish can still live underneath because there's still water down there. 
Does that make sense? So that's really good for the fish that the um, the water, or the ice is less dense than the water. Uh, the maximum density of water evidently is at four degrees Celsius. I didn't know that. <coughs> I guess once you get colder than four, it starts to freeze enough that it's starting to expand, so it gets less dense. Ice is less dense than water, so you can walk on the top of it. Um, okay. Well, didn't we already talk about this? Is this on your notes again? All right, I apologize. Um, I mean, this is kind of useful down here because, again, this shows the, uh, the hydrogen bond here, the hydrogen bond here, hydrogen bond, hydrogen bond. By the way, my PLTW people, where did we talk about hydrogen bonds? Remember? Do you remember? It's been a year or two for you. Are you in HBS this year? Okay. You don't remember from last year? Do you remember Nanel? Okay, we talked about it with proteins when they fold on themselves, right? The other pl big place was DNA, right? You remember those base pairs are connected with hydrogen bonds, okay? And those are always shown with dotted lines, all right? Um, I don't know what that means, so we'll skip it. Oh, okay. So it's <laughs> saying A and B are either N, O, or F. But we've already talked about N, O, and F, all right? So don't worry about that. Yeah. Well, intermolecularly, yes. It's okay. It's possible for them to bond together, but they usually don't form a covalent bond. They can sometimes. Okay, so now we need to talk about some of the properties of liquids that happen, especially water, because of hydrogen bonding. So we're just kind of taking a break from the not taking a break, but we're we're talking about the ramifications here of hydrogen bonding. All right? Surface tension is one. All right, these water molecules are really attracted to each other. So have you ever noticed uh, one of those little bugs like walking across the top of the water? A water strider. All right, there are other bugs that can do that as well, right? And they're kind of like, they've got their legs all spread out, you know, and they're walking across. The reason that works is because water at the surface kind of pulls in. It's attracted to itself. So it makes this film on the top of the water, okay? That film allows small things to float on top of it without breaking through the water, okay? So that's surface tension. It's the amount of energy required to stretch or increase the surface of a liquid. That's a, I don't like that definition. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to have to redo these notes for next year. Um, basically, surface tension is the fact that these water molecules are holding on to one another tightly, okay? And it's how much force you would have to apply to break them apart, okay? And again, high surface tension uh, happens because of strong intermolecular forces, okay? So can you think of other liquids that have maybe even higher surface tension than water? Syrup. Syrup. That's a good one, right? Like corn syrup or regular syrup or, you know, um, just syrup molasses. in general. Molasses, okay, or molasses or honey, oh, yeah. right? Okay? Those sorts of things have much higher surface tension than water. So what do you think we can say about their intermolecular forces? Stronger. They're stronger. They're really attracted to one another. Each of those molecules is really attracted to the other ones around it. Okay? That's why it's so thick. Okay? Um, cohesion is the intermolecular attraction between like molecules. So cohesion is what water does when it's sticking to itself. You guys ever seen that, uh, that Rain-X stuff? Any of your parents use that on their windshield? Um, are any of you driving? I guess some of you are driving at this point, yeah. Have, have any of you actually used it on your windshield? Have you? It's, it's basically this wax-like wax stuff that you put on your windshield, okay? And the water isn't attracted at all to the wax, so the water is just attracted to itself. So you get these raindrops falling, and they bead up. They, they get in these really huge beads, and then as you're driving down the road, they just kind of fly off the windshield. So, it, you know, it, yeah, it helps, it helps when it's raining. That way you can see a little bit better, okay? And that works because the water is attracted to itself, okay? But if you don't put the Rain-X on there, guess what the water is also attracted to? The glass on the windshield, right? That's adhesion. It's the attraction of the water the glass, okay? 
So at that point, the water just kind of spreads out on the glass and makes everything really hazy unless you're using your windshield wipers, right? Does that make sense? Cohesion, the water's sticking together itself. Adhesion, the water's sticking to the glass. They're both because of intermolecular forces, but it's just what are they being attracted to? So this is another example of adhesion, okay? Um, when you put a, it has to be a really, really thin tube, okay? We have these tubes that uh, you probably won't use unless you're in, you go into AP chemistry next year, um, but they're called capillary tubes, these really thin glass tubes. And if you put them into water, the water is attracted to the sides of the glass enough that it can actually overcome the force of gravity and the water will just start rising up the tube. You don't have to do anything to it. All you have to do is just put it in the water and the water will start going up the tube. I think you guys have talked about this before. Does this sound familiar at all? When have you talked about capillary action? I can tell something distracting is going on out here. <laughs> I don't know how much that's going to help. But Okay, so capillary action. When, when have you talked about that before? In biology, right? Okay. In biology, capillary action happens in? No, not in the nucleus. You guys don't remember? Okay, what kinds of things need to get water from the bottom of them to the top of them? There you go. It happens in plants, right? So the plants have these thin stems on the inside these thin openings, so the water can actually travel up using this process from the bottom of the plant to the top of the plant, and that's how the top of the plant gets the water. Okay? That's adhesion. Um, now, you can actually have this working in reverse if, uh, and I think this is uh, like mercury and glass. The mercury is not at all attracted to the glass. It's just attracted to itself, okay? So it's actually going to pull in on itself a little bit, and it will sink down rather than rising up the tube. Okay? Viscosity is another one. Viscosity has to do with um, the attraction of one molecule for another. So if I say something's really viscous, I'm saying that it's really thick. That's what I mean by that. Okay? They've already kind of talked about this. Give me an example of some viscous things. Some Molasses. things that are really thick. Molasses, honey, right? Syrup. So you can see where, I don't know that you're familiar with a lot of these, honestly, but it's interesting to just kind of look at where some of these fall. Water is the most viscous on this list. And we don't necessarily think of water usually as being all that thick, right? But it's thicker than a lot of other things, okay? Um, it's thicker than acetone. You guys know what acetone is? Nail polish remover, right? Um, benzene, you're probably not going to be all that familiar with. Uh, that's a carcinogen, so, you know, don't, don't put that on your hands or something. Um, blood is less viscous than water. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Am I going the wrong way here? No, 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 no. It's, it's less viscous than water. No, it's not. These aren't in order. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's confusing. <laughs> These should be in order, but they're not, okay? Blood is more viscous than water, which actually kind of makes sense. There's some things in blood that cause it to, you know, be thicker than, isn't that an expression even? Blood is thicker than water? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, there you go. It is. <laughs> Scientifically, that is a correct statement. I, does it have something to do with, like, family? Yeah. Yeah, I don't quite understand that expression, actually. What's that mean? Like, blood, blood is thick and blood. Then blonder. Okay, so blood, I get yeah, that. I like more so important. <laughs> Of water. Okay. Is that what it is? Huh. I never understood that. Okay. And the people on the video won't because I'm sure they didn't hear your explanation and I didn't repeat it. <laughs> all right, fine. I'll repeat it. So we're all made of water, right? But if you're related by blood. Um, ethanol, that goes in your uh, gas tanks often. Okay, most, uh, most of your gas has some ethanol in it, uh, up to like 20%, I think. And that's a little more viscous than water, so you can get an idea of that, okay? Strong intermolecular forces. 
and high viscosity. Okay, so strong intermolecular forces equals high viscosity. Um, but we already kind of talked about that. Is there anything else I want to say about that? Oh, one other thing that can change the viscosity, and you don't need to know this, but it's just kind of interesting, is temperature. What do you think temperature does to viscosity? As I heat something, what do you think happens to uh, its thickness? It kind of gets thinner. It gets less viscous, right? Any of you have uh, parents, or maybe you do this, who put syrup into the microwave before you eat it? Well, probably the main reason you're doing that is because you like the hot syrup, okay? But another reason to do it, I suppose, is because it's going to be easier to pour after you heat it up because it's less thick. So there you go. All right. Uh, the, we need to talk about two more kind of intermolecular forces. One of them definitely is. This one sort of is, okay? I guess we'll call this intermolecular. Ion dipole forces. So we've talked about two already. What's the first intermolecular force we talked about? Well, hydrogen bonding was one of them. What's the one we talked about before hydrogen bonding? Dipole, dipole, okay? So this is a third one. This is ion dipole, okay? So this one is the attractive forces between an ion and a polar molecule, okay? Do you think this is stronger or weaker than the forces we've talked about so far? And you have two options, basically. Um, so does an ion have more of a charge or less of a charge than a polar molecule? That's the question, really. So we've got NaCl. That's an ionic compound, right? And then we've got something like uh, HF. We've talked about both of these, right? What happens in an ionic compound like NaCl? What happens to the electrons? There's a complete transfer from one thing to another, right? So now the chlorine has all eight of them, right? And it has a negative charge. The sodium just lost it, the last one that it had in its valence shell, so now it's got a positive charge, okay? That's a completely like a one plus, one minus charge, okay? In the HF, what happens to the electrons? They're being shared. Now, they're not being shared equally. They're closer to the fluorine than they are to the hydrogen, but they are being shared. Okay? So we call this a partial negative and a partial positive. Not all the way one plus, all the way one minus. It's just kind of charged on either end. Does that make sense? So the ions actually have a stronger charge than the polar molecule. So you put an ion with a polar molecule, the attraction is going to be stronger between those two than it would be if you just put a polar molecule next to another polar molecule. Does that make sense? All right? This is actually why salt dissolves so well in water, because what happens is the water, which is polar, is very attracted to the ions, so the water actually kind of surrounds it. So this oxygen right here, very attracted to this sodium, right? And so you end up with all these water molecules that are surrounding the Na+, plus, like this. should have made that further away so you could see the dots. That's supposed to be like dashed lines showing an intermolecular force there. Okay? So the water molecules surround the sodium, and then the same thing will happen with the chlorine. The water molecules will surround the chlorines as well, and basically just starts pulling them apart from one another, and that's why the salt dissolves in the water. Okay? Um, I guess we're doing okay on time. It's a long note day. Yeah. Sorry about that. Okay, so here's an ion-dipole interaction. So you've got your dipole right here with a positive and a negative end, and then you've got your actual ion, like Na plus or I minus or that sort of thing. Okay? Those are strong interactions. These are the strongest intermolecular forces we have talked about. Actually, these are the strongest that there are. Okay? So you might just make a star next to the ion-dipole forces, label them. These are the strongest intermolecular forces. Okay, last one we need to talk about is London dispersion. So now, now what we need to talk about is 
what if a molecule is completely nonpolar? Is it attracted to any of the other molecules around it? Because if it's nonpolar, it doesn't have a charge, right? Um, so an example of something that's nonpolar would be like uh, an N2 molecule, nitrogen and nitrogen, okay? N2, which, let me see if I do this Lewis structure right. I think that's a triple bond. Yeah, that's right. So that's N2, all right? There is no positive or negative end on that molecule. So you put that next to another N2 molecule, how strong do you think the attraction is between them? There's really not any reason for them to be attracted to one another, is there? Well, here's the thing. Turns out things are never quite as simple as they seem. Electrons are always moving, okay? So if electrons are moving, then at some point, there may be more electrons on this side of the atom, or this side of the molecule, than there are on the other side. So for a moment, just for a moment, there might be a little bit of a negative charge over here and a little bit of a positive charge over here. And then on this one, there might be a little bit of a positive charge and a little bit of a negative charge just for a moment as the electrons are moving around. At that moment, do you think these would be a little attracted to each other? Just at that moment, there might be a little bit of an attraction that forms. But guess what happens? In the next moment, what do you think happens? It goes away, right? Okay? So they're attracted, then they're not. Then they're attracted, then they're not. That's, it's called an instantaneous dipole. Okay? And what that basically means is, for a split second, there's an attraction there. As the electrons are kind of just moving around. And then it goes away. <laughs> sure, yeah. It's like, they get attracted for a second, and then they're like, and then, yeah, and then they make contact, and they're like, nope, no, no, can't do that. Okay? And then they try again, and these poor nonpolar molecules, they just can't ever get their act together, okay? Um, but that's kind of the idea. It's called an instantaneous dipole because it happens for a split second and then it goes away. So how do you think these rank on the strength of the intermolecular forces? These are probably the weakest. All other things being equal, these are usually the weakest forces, okay? Temporary dipoles induced in atoms or molecules, okay? So it forms, then it goes away. Forms, then it goes away. Forms, then it goes away. This one is the weakest, London dispersion, okay? Now, again, there's other, there's other things at play there, like the size of the molecule and stuff like that. If, if you have a bigger molecule, then actually these London dispersion forces can get pretty strong. But for the most part, they're going to be the weakest. Um, so then hopefully what I just explained makes sense. I know this diagram is a little weird here. Um, but it's showing like a nonpolar molecule moving close to an ion maybe and then there's, there's a little bit of a polarity that forms there and then it's attracted to something else. <coughs> um, you can have these ion-induced dipole interactions. Don't worry too much about that. Dipole-induced dipole interactions. Or you can just have, you know, two nonpolar molecules next to each other that for just a moment they'll have these attractions for one another, okay? Instantaneous temporary dipole attractions. That's one in dispersion. And this basically just explains in writing what I, what I said in words, okay? Do you guys have to write that down or is that, that's all filled in for you? Oh, you needed something on the last slide? Sorry. What did you need there? Ion-induced dipole and then dipole-induced dipole. I'm not really as worried that you know that anyway. Okay. Um, these one and dispersion forces actually exist in every particle, uh, polar, nonpolar, in everything, okay? They're usually very weak forces. Um, this is the force that attracts nonpolar nonpol non atoms or molecules together. So we've already talked about that, okay? An example is chlorine gas. I gave the example of N2 
Uh, this example on here is Cl2. Okay, chlorine gas is Cl2 because remember that's one of your diatomic molecules. It's one of the ones that can never be by itself. So Cl2 again, completely nonpolar, but it's a little bit attracted to other Cl2 molecules um, because of that temporary dipole that happens just for a second and then it goes away. Um, so what happens to chlorine gas when you compress it into a liquid? Why do you think that you can make it a liquid eventually? That it can form stronger intermolecular forces? Well, what are you doing to it to make it a liquid? You're pushing the molecules closer together, right, as you're compressing them. Push them closer together, more of those dipoles have a chance to form, temporary dipoles, okay, and then eventually uh, they overcome their shyness a little bit, right, and they can actually kind of interact with one another in a liquid form. Um, yeah, so again, you've got your Cl2 molecules. When they come together, they might form this instantaneous dipole for a second, and then you get these weak attractions that happen. Okay, so that's just a picture uh, showing what happens there. Polarizability is how easy it is for uh, the electron distribution to be distorted. Okay? Turns out the bigger the molecule, the easier it is to polarize. The more electrons it has, easier it is to push those electrons to one side or the other to kind of make it uneven. Okay? And so the bigger the molecule is, the stronger the London dispersion forces. So greater number of electrons, greater polarizability, larger electron clouds, kind of the same thing. So, dispersion forces usually increase with molar mass. That's what you really need to understand. The bigger the mass of the molecule, the stronger the London dispersion forces. Okay? Yes? What's that? None of this is on your notes? Okay, that's all right. We'll just practice it. Don't worry about writing it down. Okay? Actually, you know what? I would write this last thing down. Dispersion forces increase with molar mass. Okay, so the, the more molar mass, <laughs> bigger the molar mass, the bigger the dispersion forces. And you can see that over here. These are all uh, completely nonpolar molecules, every single one of them, okay? Uh, the lightest one is CH4. That one melts at negative 182.5, okay? That's a pretty low melting point. Uh, but then you get down to Cl4, that's the most massive of all of those, and it has a melting point of 171. And this is Celsius, right? So that's a higher, higher melting point than the boiling point of water. So you have to actually get this really, really hot to even cause it to become a liquid. Okay. So the bigger they get, the stronger those London dispersion forces are. That's what you need to remember. Um, what type of intermolecular forces exist between each of the following? Okay, so let's practice this for a second. I'm going to give you guys a worksheet before we leave today. Um, HBr, what types of intermolecular forces are we going to have here? This is where it gets a little tough. Okay, so remember, hydrogen bonding forms when, it's, when the hydrogen is connected to what? No, hydrogen bonding is fawn. Remember? Fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen, not bromine, okay? So there's no hydrogen bonding here. Is this a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule? That's really the question you need to ask yourself on these. Can we agree that that's polar? Because there's two different atoms here, right? They're going to have two different electronegativities, so there's going to be a positive and a negative end on this molecule. Does that make sense? So if it's polar, then what kind of uh, intermolecular attraction do we have here? Well, what? Okay, dipole, dipole, right? Because polar means that it forms a dipole. It has a positive and a negative end, right? So you get another HBr molecule around this one, and it's going to form these dipole-dipole interactions. Okay? 
Now there's one other intermolecular force on the HBr. And it's the force that's on every single molecule always. We just talked about it. Should I go back to that one? Yeah. Instantaneous um, exists in every particle, okay? So every molecule has London dispersion forces. If you want to abbreviate those and sound really cool while you do it, you can just call it LDF. I'll know what that stands for, okay? LDF. Dipole, dipole, and LDF. It can have more than one force, okay? What about CH4? CH4, polar or nonpolar? That's really the first question you always have to ask on these. Nonpolar, right? Okay. So if it's nonpolar, then it can't be dipole dipole. Can't be hydrogen bonding because it's not that hydrogen's not connected to a fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. It's not there's no ions here, right? So it's not ion dipole. So what does that leave? LDF, that's it. It's the only one on that one. Okay? And then SO2. And we might have to actually draw out the Lewis structure for this one to know for sure because you've got to figure out if it's polar or nonpolar, right? So SO2, I believe, ends up looking like this, or else it's a resonance. I'm not sure. Let me count up the electrons here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now there's only, wait a second. Supposed to be 18 there. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. It is going to have that. Well, now it's going to have to have, or actually maybe, here, here's what it's going to be. Sorry. I got ahead of myself there. I didn't follow my own rules. Okay, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. So we ran out of electrons. The sulfur's not quite happy. So what do we have to do here? We have to make a double bond between one of the sulfurs and one of the oxygens. Okay, so this actually is going to end up being a resonance. doesn't really matter because what did we find out by drawing the Lewis structure here? And how do we know it's polar? Because of this right here, right? It has a lone pair of electrons on the central atom, so that's going to be polar, all right? So if it's polar, what does that mean? Dipole, dipole. Now, that one's a little tricky because if you look at SO2, that looks a little bit nonpolar to me. I don't know why. Maybe it's because CO2 is nonpolar. So you have to draw out the Lewis structure for some of these to make sure, okay? There's another force that this one has. That everything has LDF. Okay. All right. So that's how that works. Does that make sense? So uh, there's a few of these that are going to be on there. I'm not going to kill you with these because I know these are tough. All right. So let me give you your homework, and we will have a quiz tomorrow. We'll probably do a little bit of review on this before we take the quiz, though, because I know this is tough stuff. The answer keys will be on Moodle.